about 20, 21, 22, and then the other most parts of the world. The point is, that one verse lays out the whole book. It's, it's just talking about how the Holy Ghost is going to empower the church, and then they're going to start witnessing with boldness and power, first of all in the city they are, then in the county or region that they are, then to people that are not Jews like them, that are Samaritans, and then to the other parts of the world. And you know at that time who ruled the world, the Romans. It was a, it was a Roman, and of course a non-Jew is a Gentile. So then spreading out to the known world ruled by Rome and filled with Gentiles. So that's like a little mini outline right in that verse. But, but here's why verse 9 is so important. Uh, question. Uh, who, who's, who's talking in the red? Who's talking in the red? Jesus. And who is he talking to? Okay. Why do we make a distinction between apostles and disciples? Because apostles were with him from the beginning. He chose the apostles. Huh? They were the 12. And now they're the what? 11 because Judas is gone. But what's the central thought I always tell you about the difference between apostles and disciples? Every apostle, go ahead. Our witness. The, the apostles are the eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. Apostles were chosen. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, they saw, Here we go. They, they had to witness the his every, every apostle is a disciple, but not every disciple is an apostle. In other words, the word apostle actually, if you look at it, if you study it out, it actually means special messengers. So they were the ones who got it be the eyewitnesses to carry this. It's, it's going, the gospel is going to rise or fall on them. It's going to, it's going to live or die on them. Because they're the actual eyewitnesses. But, but, but here's the point. Every apostle started out as a disciple. Jesus called them out from the general pool, if you will, of disciples, and then handpicked them to be the twelve, right? So every, every apostle is a disciple, but every disciple is not an apostle. So let me analogize it to you. Every, every pastor is a born-again believer, but every born-again believer is not a pastor. So it's, just, it's just like church leadership. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That's all it is. All right, so now Jesus is talking to who? The apostles. Okay? This is important. This is really, it's really kind of important because he's... he's now focusing his attention on the ones that have to carry this gospel, right? And he tells them, so literally, he was telling them that they're going to receive this power. But we do know that when the power came down in Acts chapter 2, there were more than just the apostles in the upper room, right? How do we know that? Huh? How do we know that? Verse 15. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the, of the disciples, see, and said the number of names together were about 120. So we know that's not just talking about the apostles because there were only 12 apostles. One of them's already hung himself from dead and that's Judas. So there were 11. So the 120, that the 120 which includes the 11, so there's what? What is that? 109 disciples. 109 disciples and 11 apostles in the room. Right? Yes. Are we together? Yes. Okay. But, but, notice, here's what I really want you to see. When I said that verse 9 was really important, verse 9 is really important because it says, and when he had spoken these things, we know who he is, that's right, Jesus, because we just said that, we saw him in Reddit, right? When he had spoken these things, we know who he was talking to, he was talking to his, at that time, his apostles. Now, we know 
Later on in verse 15, we see him in the upper room, mm -hmm. and the disciples came. But if you study it out closely, they kind of came later. They, in fact, we can even see it when it says, watch this. Look at this. I told you, I don't show you in the Bible, you don't have to believe, right? Verse 13. And when they were come in, they went into an upper room, where abode who? Peter and James and John and Andrew. So who's that? These are all the apostles, right? Okay, so that they came into this upper room. It didn't say all the disciples came into the upper room. It said they, the apostles, came into the upper room, right? right. Then it says, then it says, oh, and it says they, verse fourteen, they these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. Now with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So the picture is the apostles in verse 13 were come in to the upper room. And they abode there. Well, what does abide there mean? They stayed there, right? Then it connects. Well, that's just the roll call of who the name of the apostles are. Then it connects with verse 14. It says they all continue there with prayer and supplication. And then it says with, which implies Mary, Jesus' mother, or well, excuse me, women, and then also Mary, Jesus' mother, and then his brother, literally meaning the, the siblings of Jesus. You know, Jesus did have some siblings. Don't get thrown by the fact that she was the Virgin Mary. She was the Virgin Mary before she had Jesus. But she had some other children, what? After Jesus, right? And if you study it out, you get the name. But the, but the point is, the apostles are there, they're praying, and then we can only imagine how Mary and the women and the Jesus' siblings came to join them. What happened? Somebody sent word, whatever. Somebody let them know they were there. You just have to fill in that blank, right? It's reasonable to assume that the word got out, they sent up, because you know, they're they're still in Jerusalem where there's, there's Roman pressure all around them, right? To find out where they are, to hurt them, and all this, to persecute them. And so somehow they got word to the women and to Mary and to his uh, brethren, his, literally his siblings, and they joined them. And then it says in verse 15, now in those days, and in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, and now there's 120. Right here in verse 14, that's not 120, is it? That's not 120. That's the disciples, that's the apostles, which were 11, Mary, 12, his brethren, you studied out, I think it's that, about three or four brothers and sisters, and some women. So that's nowhere near 120. But by the time we get to verse 15, now more of the disciples heard, and now they're there. Correct? Okay. Here's what I'm really trying to get you to see. I'm still making my case for verse 9, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody say verse 9. Verse 9. And when he, Jesus, had spoken these things to who? The apostles. While they beheld, he, Jesus, was taken up. Mm. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, that seems like a very insignificant verse of Scripture. Especially compared to verse 8, which tells you what the whole book's going to be about. The church is going to get some power, and it's going to have the power to be an effective witness of Christ. And it's going to start in Jerusalem, go to Judea, go to Samaria, and Samaria is significant because it, it, it implies going outside of the race. In other words, if, if you need power to be a witness, first of all, you need it with your own people. That's Jerusalem. Then you're going to need it with the, with the folk in the neighborhood that may not you know, be your own relatives. But then you're going to need it in Samaria with people that are not of your own race. And then lastly, throughout the whole world, meaning all kinds of strangers. Now that's significant, but what about verse 9? And when Jesus had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. 
who, who's got their thinking cap on tonight? Why would you think that verse is significant to the whole book of the book of Acts? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Yeah. Okay, the way he left is the way he's going to come back. Uh, and when we study that out, uh, you find out that, that he left. Uh, it says he left in verse 11. The same Jesus which is taken up from you to heaven shall so come in the like manner as you've seen him. And when you study that out, you find out that that means that he left from the Mount of Olives. And I believe it's Zechariah who prophesied that Jesus is going to, when he comes back, he's going to touch his feet down on the Mount of Olives. In other words, you want to know when Jesus is going to come back when he comes to heaven? It ain't going to be New York. It ain't going to be D.C. It ain't going to be L.A. He ain't coming to see no movies. He's going to be coming. He's going to put his feet down on the Mount of Olives. Because why? That's where the last place where he left from. But that's not really what I'm looking for. That's 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 that that's a that's a true fact. But the question is, why is that? Yeah, what, what? take a stab. But this is this might take us the rest of the, the Bible study. But but there's something I'm trying to get you to see about this. Well, it seems like to me he is. They're having a discussion, and um, the disciples are there. They're the ones who is going to be their witness and be really responsible for multiplying his name and deeds all and and his reason for being here all over the world. He wanted them to see that he was the true Christ because he wanted them to know that they saw him going into heaven and they could tell that to the world. That's a good argument. <laughs> Not what I'm looking for, but that's a good argument. No, 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 it's a good, it's a good position. Because what she just said was, all right, let me help bolster your argument a little bit. What she just said was that, if I can lend my uh, little, little help to her, what she just said was before Jesus was resurrected, we know based on, um, uh, based on Mark chapter 16 and Luke chapter 24, excuse me, that um, the disciples, excuse me, the apostles, uh, before they actually saw Jesus in his resurrection body, his resurrected body, they didn't believe. Right? They did not believe. Now, it was so important that they, as someone said, that they be the eyewitnesses of the key things that happened with Jesus, that he had to uh, present himself to them in his resurrected body so that they would believe, right? Thomas is not the only one who doubted. They all doubted. So Jesus had to show himself to them in his resurrection body, right? But, but, but it didn't just stop with him showing himself to them on Sunday afternoon in his resurrected body. He then, he then, Shows him to himself to them in his resurrected body for 40 days after he resurrects. Look at verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. You know that word, you know the movie The Passion of the Christ? What does that word passion mean? Huh? It means his suffering. 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 Because if you, again, if you study it out, it'll tell you exactly that. It means it's suffering. All right? Um, after his passion. Pasho. It means to experience a sensation or impression, to feel, to suffer, or to be vexed. So the, the Greek word there, pasho, literally means to experience a great sensation of suffering. So that whole movie, The Passion of the Christ, it lived up to his name, didn't it? That is all about suffering. It, it was not a movie that I ever want to see again. 
It's the only movie, you know how a pastor loves popcorn, right? It's the only movie I ever saw in my life that didn't eat no popcorn. Like, I ate some popcorn watching this, my Lord go through things like So anyway, the point is, the point is, let's get back to it. It says, let's, let's read it again. It says, to whom, verse 3, he also showed himself alive, to whom he also showed himself alive. See, he had to prove that to them that he was alive. Now watch this. After his passion, meaning after his suffering. Now, literally, it also implies the crucifixion, right? The suffering and, of course, the, the, the culmination of all that was the crucifixion. After his suffering, by many infallible proofs. Oh, he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. What were those infallible proofs? Eating with them, talking with them, <laughs> teaching them, letting them touch them. He showed himself alive to them by many infallible proofs. There it is, being seen of them, how many days? 40 days. 40 days. See, this was critical that they, without a doubt, what they say in the court, without a shadow of a what? Without a shadow of a doubt. <coughs> no, it could be any doubt about this. So, Maybe the first day he showed himself to them, maybe they all thought that they had a hallucination. He said, oh, no, 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 I, I think I'll, it's going to be a 40 day. You know, 40 is the, is the number of, of testing. 40 is the number of testing. Amen? God let it rain for 40 days, right? Okay. Uh, now, now watch this. It says, the thing, it says, being seen in that 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So during his 40 days, he kept preaching them about the kingdom of God. So back to Minister Martha's point. He, he wanted to make sure not only that they were convinced um, of his death, he wanted to make sure not only were they convinced of his resurrection, but verse 9 points to the fact that they would be eyewitnesses and they were convinced of his what? Ascension. So he ascended right in front of them. He did, it wasn't about we heard that Jesus, you know, I heard the Lord ascended. No, no, no. I saw the Lord ascend. So that's an excellent uh, point that, that that verse is uh, important for that. But there's something else I'm trying to get at. And somebody has had a hand up. Yes. Sister Sale, Sister Karen, go ahead. Why is why is that significant, that verse significant to the entire book and indeed to us? Because he, he told them, he had told, already told his, uh, his uh, the apostles that they were going to receive power after he had ascended. Okay. He told them he was going to have, they, that they were going to receive power after. Right. All right. Uh, from, a, from a chronological standpoint, you could make the argument that, uh, well, let's see what he said. He said, he said in verse 8, you shall receive power. He didn't say, well, let me, let me just say this. He didn't say after I've ascended. He said, you receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But, but, but being a good, good go advice. ahead. But he had told them, he said, he had told them in explaining what was going to happen to him, he had told them that he needed to go to the Father. And when did he tell them that? In, um, well, in the Gospels. Like yes, in the Gospels. Yeah. Who can help her out? Um, I would say Matthew. Who can help her out? Now, come on, y'all. I, I taught y'all this. Um, the no, no, no. Listen now. Listen. I taught you this. Jesus predicting the coming of the Holy right. Spirit. I told you it's found in three chapters in the yeah. book of what? Uh, John. Okay. What are those three chapters? No, I'm talking about the book of John. Book of John. What are those three okay. chapters, Sister Cynthia? Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. That should be on. That should be right there in the forefront of your mind. It should be. Come on, Sharon. Uh, Come on. John. Chapter 16 is one of them. That's an actually correct verse, 16, 13. 14, 15, and 16. Chapter 14, 15, and 16. Somebody say 14, 14 15, 15, and 16. So in those three chapters, 
he talks about the coming of the comforter. Yeah. Comforter means what? It, it literally it translates as helper. helper. And he does say that if I don't, if I don't leave, go. in mm -hmm. fact, the, the opposite verse would be uh, chapter 16, verse 7. If I don't leave, he can't come. If I, in other words, I don't leave, I can't send him. Send him. And of course, John 15, 20 